Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And I'm back for another YouTube comments Q&A session. This is the segment where I answer your questions from the YouTube comments from the past few weeks. So let me jump right into that. But before I do that, if you are in the process of setting up a new studio or you're having trouble with the sound at your mixing setup, at your desk, at your production desk, maybe because your low end is off or because you can't quite figure out what's going on with reverb and kind of panning elements, then I want you to check out my Phantom Speaker Test Workshop that you can sign up to for free at the link in the description. This is my step-by-step -step guide to show you how to set up your desk and speakers correctly, no matter what room you're in. And that's really the special part about this because there are a bunch of kind of guidelines and kind of rules of thumb flying around on the webs about how to set up your desk and speakers correctly. The problem is they really only work somewhat in very standardized rectangular rooms. But if your room is kind of slightly oddly shaped, maybe you've got a, a corner somewhere that isn't quite right. Maybe you're, you've got a slanted ceiling, angled walls, doors and windows in awkward places, then you might find that these rules of thumb don't work for you. And that's why I developed the Phantom Speaker Test. This is a two-step process, a simple two-step listening test process that helps you, first of all, identify where in your room the low end sounds the best so you can make sure that you build your setup around that spot and then how to set up your speakers correctly so you get the best stereo image, the best sound stage that you possibly can inside the space that you actually have with treatment, without treatment, no matter where you are in the process of actually treating your room, this step-by-step -step process will help you figure out how you can get that ideal sound and that perfect phantom center that gives us a soundstage, a, a sound from our speakers that is as best as possible, that guarantees as best as possible that we can actually get our mixes to translate. So this is my phantom speaker test workshop. Again, you can sign up to that for free at the link in the description. But with that, let's jump into the first question. So here we've got one from Jordan Gressman. This is on a video called DIY Home Studio Acoustics. Can a room be too big? And he says, if you see this lol, I was wondering what steps one takes when upgrading speakers with existing acoustic treatment. I want to take the budget I was going to put towards new speakers all into acoustic treatment. But if I decide to upgrade later on, what would I need to consider? Is there any reason I would need to redo my treatment? Thanks again. Um, the short answer is no, you definitely don't need to redo your treatment. Um, it somewhat depends on the exact speakers that you're getting. Yeah. If you do decide to upgrade later on, but let's just say we're kind of upgrading cross grading in the typical near field, mid field speaker category. So your kind of typical two way or three way speakers that you might use in a home studio, then there isn't really much to consider in terms of treatment. It will be very, very similar, yeah? but probably exactly the same. Yeah, you might you might find that you that you want to tweak certain things. But more than anything with different speakers, it's about optimizing their position in the room to really get that sound stage, to really get that uh, that sound feel that you want in order to be able to work properly. And we're talking minute adjustments here. Yeah, it's not going to be crazy different. Yeah, but if anything, with a new speaker, you want to make sure that you set them up again. You go through the process of setting them up properly again. That's why I was just talking about my Phantom Speaker Test Workshop. Yeah, it's that same process that you want to repeat anytime you make any major changes to your room, including the treatment. Yeah, so you want to you want to go through that process of making sure that they're set up properly, and then potentially, if you're using some sort of room correction software, some sort of speaker equalization, that you redo that as well. Yeah, but uh, in terms of the actual treatment, there isn't much that you need to change if you're upgrading speakers in that typical kind of near field, mid field category of speakers. Good question, though. Moving on, here's one from Reborn on the video on computer screens. What's the right size for more studio? And they ask another question, which I wouldn't mind if someone really answered. Would you recommend using a TV in your studio instead of a monitor? 
short answer from my side definitely is no don't use a tv mainly because the resolution unless i mean yeah sure you can get 4k tvs these days um but um they they don't really look that great at the typical distances that we use a a t a computer monitor at yeah i also wouldn't really recommend going beyond kind of 2k resolution yeah because uh, if you go for a 4k monitor or tv things are going to get so small on a very big screen that you're you're going to have a hard time really seeing what you're doing yeah so at the typical distances that we position a computer screen a computer monitor i would recommend definitely sticking to a computer monitor and then picking one with kind of the typical 2k 1k hd or 2k resolution that in my opinion works the best moving on here is one from blake stadnik on a video called confusing speaker placement tips and how to deal with them and blake says is there any actual rule or guideline at all for the distance between your speakers there is one guideline and that is that you need to set them up in a way that you get a proper sound stage and a proper phantom center yeah unfortunately this is completely dependent on your actual room and your speakers and if you've done any type of treatment and what type of treatment there are a lot of it depends as part of this guideline yeah that's why it's so important to use your ears to set up your speakers that's why it's so important to have a strategy to set up your uh, your speakers a process to follow that walks you kind of through figuring out where that best position is yeah but there isn't any kind of you need four feet between your speakers as a as a guideline that doesn't exist yeah um it's it's really dependent on your speakers on your room and your treatment around the speakers um that will affect how the sound or what sound actually rises at your ear which then obviously builds the um, the sound stage and the phantom center and so uh, the 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 rule isn't on kind of physical uh, measurements if you will it's not on it the guidelines aren't about distances they are on qu the quality of the sound that you get and you need to you need to have somebody show you how to uh, how to systematically work your way towards that end goal yeah again that's what my phantom speaker test workshop is for yeah so check that out at the link if in the description if you haven't already cool next one this one is by Aslak Skardarud, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, this one is on a video called DIY Home Studio Acoustics. How much treatment do you actually need to hear a difference? And he says, any thoughts, experience on making the whole back wall a 16, 60 centimeter deep bass absorber? Short answer is yes, go for it. <laughs> yeah the deeper the absorption the lower down in frequency you get you do need to figure out what density of material you want to use in a 60 centimeter deep base absorber if you're using purely porous absorption uh, which i recommend if you're diying then uh, you need to figure out what density to go with and um, just as a, a hint it's going to be very low density yeah at that depth you're going to look at something like pink fluffy stuff in the us yeah this is uh extremely low density it's just about the lowest density insulation material you can buy yeah also check out the um, porous absorber calculator i'll link to that in the in the description as well and you can uh enter depths and or you can play around with different depths and densities to figure out what kind of combination of depth and density uh, gives you the optimal absorption coefficient yeah uh, don't overthink this yeah there are a lot of very practical restrictions when we're making these decisions yeah the ideal is often far from what we can do in practice yeah so uh, just keep that in mind that you don't go nuts about this but uh, that's what you want to look at yeah short answer is d definitely do it all right here's one from warp academy on a video called confusing speaker placement tips and how to deal with them so they say, interesting, discuss interesting discussion. From what you're saying about optimizing first for stereo field and ignoring boundary locations, I said ignoring boundary interference 
uh, response, kind of the, the character of that. I'm curious about a few things. I have a rectangular room with parallel walls and materials on either side with the same reflection or coefficient on acoustic properties, like many interior rooms of residential construction. Then your stereo field is going to be fairly good. Um, I'm going to get back to that. Especially if you treat primary reflection zones with broadband absorbers, which are cheap and easy to obtain. However, by ignoring speaker wall distance and boundary location, again, make sure this is, we're not talking about boundary location here, we're talking, we're talking about the the boundary interference response, especially distance from the front wall, you now create an issue that you cannot easily solve with treatment or EQ. That's not correct. It can actually be easily solved with treatment, but not with EQ. That is correct. By not placing the speakers as tight to the front wall as possible, you create a non-minimum phase interference, which will totally compromise your low end. That is not correct. We're not talking about non-minimum -min phase uh, we're not talking about the, the the question of minimum phase when we're talking uh, when we're looking at boundary interference. We're talking about or we're looking at whether a certain uh, frequency causes a in phase interference or a an out of phase interference. This is not about minimum phase. Yeah, this the the entire breadth of from completely in phase to completely out of phase is covered depending on the frequency when we're talking about speaker boundary interference. Anyway, I'm just going to continue reading this question. By placing monitors as close to the front wall as possible, you create a minimum phase effect with the front wall loading. Again, this isn't quite correct. You, know, you, you create an in-phase effect with the front wall for the majority of the spectrum. Yeah, that's the, the point. Then easily shelf it down with an LF shelf in the monitor drive signal. You got that correct, yeah. Plus many small monitors actually benefit from the front wall loading LF. Yeah, yeah. And mostly I would agree to that, yeah. There are instances where that's not the case, but in, in as, a, as a kind of a general rule of thumb, that's the case, yes. You cannot adequately compensate for non-minimum phase effects even with adaptive digital EQ. Again, we're not talking about minimum phase effects here, but you're right in that uh, an out of phase interference cancellation can't be um, corrected with EQ. So why create the problem in the first place? Perhaps I misunderstood your advice, so I'd like to hear your response. You gotta remember this is a question of priorities. This isn't one is correct and the other is incorrect. We get pros and cons from each and the question is which gives you the higher benefit in your situation, yeah? And with the speaker boundary interference, if you actually get that problem, it tends to be a, like you said, a boost in the lowest frequencies through the in-phase component, which then turns into a cut a, a destructive interference at for the out of phase uh, component or the out of phase frequency range, but it's always just that one drop, that one cut. There's some ripple above that, but it's not nearly as bad as you think. And so we're we're comparing: Do I have a potentially amazing sound stage, phantom center, which we absolutely need? in order to balance properly, judge spaces properly, pan properly, yeah? We need those, you cannot work, you cannot mix properly if you don't have a proper soundstage. Versus potentially having none of these, but not that dip in the frequency response, yeah? So it's a matter of priorities. And if you really want to prioritize your ability to create mixes that translate, in my opinion, it heavily leans towards getting a proper soundstage first and just living with any effects that speaker boundary interference causes, if at all. Yeah, you got to remember, these don't turn up by definition always. They, they often turn up, but not always. And they are easily uh, treated with acoustic treatment. It's fairly easy to get rid of them with acoustic treatment. Yeah, so... The priority when you're setting up a new stereo system, in my opinion, shouldn't be on optimizing for wall distances. You also got to remember that this doesn't just happen on the front wall, the wall behind the speakers. This also happens potentially on the side walls. I've actually seen this happen more on side walls than front walls. 
It potentially happens on the f with the floor. It potentially happens with the ceiling. Yeah, in some by in theory at least, it potentially happens with the the back wall. Although that ten tends to be so far away that it doesn't cause a problem. But uh, you can't. You it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, it's you're basically chasing your own tail if you try and optimize the distance to all the the walls correctly, and you just ignore what that what happens in terms of stereo image yeah uh, or you live with a very half-assed stereo image yeah because that is a much more destructive or a much more su um, suboptimal sound system to work on than if you actually have a proper stereo image a proper phantom center a proper sound stage but potentially a dip in the frequency response yeah you also got to remember that our brains are great at compensating for tonality issues, but they cannot compensate for a missing soundstage. Yeah? If it's not there, your brain isn't going to rebuild it. But if you have a, a, a rough tonality, aka a rough frequency response, you can work around that problem with proper references just by um, just by spending a lot of time with it, your brain will get used to it. Your brain will build an imprint of that sound and you'll be able to work with it. Yeah. So it's a matter of priorities. Yeah. And also you got to remember that um, certain, just certain assumptions that you made here aren't actually correct. But it's still a good question. It's a, it's a problem that keeps popping up. It's a, a question that keeps popping up and uh, it's definitely worth keeping to talk about it. All right, so this next one is by Kit Kit on a video called Studio Speakers Upgrade to Upgrade to a Bigger Size or Get a Sub. And he says, I'm currently still doing my treatment for my room for just speakers and considering subs afterwards. Should I really do treatment first or add the sub first and then do treatment after or vice versa? I would definitely do treatment first. Yeah, you can technically correctly tie in a sub even without treatment. Yeah, and from a from a sort of integration perspective with the speakers, it will be technically correct, but it'll still probably sound like crap just because the room isn't treatment uh, isn't treated. Yeah, and with a sub, you're pushing a lot of low energy into that room, and so you're gonna get the maximum effect of the room in the low end. Yeah, and it's just not a particularly pleasant sound to listen to and to work on yeah so i would definitely do the treatment first in a typical home studio it is also totally fine to do that because as long as you optimize your listening position first again <laughs> note my phantom speaker test workshop where i teach you how to do that then you are already located at the right spot that makes tying in a subwoofer as easy as possible yeah because you got to remember that low end balance is a matter of position in relation to the room not in relation to the speakers yeah mostly and so if you've picked that position correctly you are now set up for a balanced low end and if you decide to push more energy into that low end with a sub then you'll benefit from that extra energy in a balanced way okay so that's kind of how to think about this then i've got one here from mike mccullough i guess on the video called Acoustic Reflections, wood slats on top of absorbers. And he asks, what about wood slats just over a wall, i.e. drywall? For the scattering effect, does there need to be a fully absorptive material behind the slats? Yes, there does need to be absorptive material behind the slats. Otherwise, we're just talking about a slight geometric shift in the shape, in the, in the shape of the wall. Yeah, but for the scattering to take effect, you actually need the difference between full reflection and full absorption at least in the frequency range where the scattering is supposed to work yeah so with these slats we're typically talking talking about the effect taking place somewhere between let's say two kilohertz and seven kilohertz yeah and so even actually a thin absorption layer behind that works down to two kilohertz will do the job yeah? you don't need this the extreme deep absorption behind the slats uh, for the scattering to take effect because it only works in that kind of mid to high frequency range anyway. Yeah? And so in that range, we need the difference between reflection and absorption slats and no slats in order for the scattering to take uh, take effect to work. Yeah, good question. 
So this next one is by Paul Hamacher, I guess, um, on a video called Bass Traps. I've got this annoying resonance at 126 hertz. And he says, I've got a question. When we look at those waterfall diagrams, diagrams and some specific frequencies are louder, isn't it completely natural that the decay takes way longer? Is it always a room resonance then? Or do room resonances even take way longer to, to, to decay compared to when I just would artificially boost a specific frequency via a narrow band filter? Okay, so you got to remember just talking about room resonances in general, yeah? Standing waves, aka room modes. These are, as you rightly say, room resonances, yeah? And a, a resonance system is always associated with a certain ringing yeah you basically agitate the system it starts oscillating and it wants to continue oscillating that's what that decay or that ringing is yeah it's like a bell yeah you agitate the system and it wants to oscillate it continues ringing it keeps that energy up yeah and so that's the same that happens with the room and these standing waves or room modes now, if you, they're also associated with a, a peak in the frequency response. Yeah? So that's what we see in the waterfall diagram. We see that peak, and then following from that peak, the actual ringing. This is when we have constructive um, interference between the two sound waves that interfere in a standing wave. Yeah? Um, you also have destructive interference depending on where you look in the in the room depending on the location in the room and at that case the the energy is destructed yeah? it is basically cancelled out and obviously then there is no energy that can actually ring out but this is still a room mode effect a standing effect standing uh, wave effect so yes with room resonance it is room resonances it is completely normal that the decay takes longer than the rest of the spectrum yeah you got to remember that you're you're measuring uh, you got to take some some uh, let's say arbitrary um uh, distance if you will you got to take some volume uh delta some 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 range of volume over which you're measuring the decay time yeah so in, in usually we're talking about 60 decibels of uh of sound pressure level reduction because that's kind of the standard that was set with rt60 yeah? and we can apply the same concept to standing waves so it's a question of how long does it take for the energy to decay by 60 uh, 60 decibels but this is a range we're talking about. Where you start, your starting point sits, doesn't matter. Yeah. So you could start measuring the 60 decibel decay at 140 decibels peak and then measure how long it takes down to like 80. Or you could start measuring at 90 decibels and measure how long it takes down to 30. Yeah. So the actual starting point is it doesn't really matter this is a a relative decay measurement yeah so if you're saying is it completely natural that the decay takes way longer don't get confused just because the peak is higher and you're starting at a higher point in the graph you're still just measuring for example 60 decibels of reduction yeah um and yes that does take longer than if you would just artificially boost a specific frequency via a narrow band filter because you're now comparing a resonance that is caused by a, an EQ boost with a resonance that is caused through a standing wave, a room mode in a room. And these do not have the same decay character. In fact, a, a digital EQ boost doesn't have any decay associated with it. There's some phase shift uh, that comes along with it, but I'm getting into details that don't really matter here. Yeah? So when you were asking, uh, is the decay way longer compared to an artificial boost with a frequency, uh, with, a, with an EQ, then yes, it always is because you're not comparing the same two systems. All right? But uh, it's a good question. Yeah? Um, interesting to think about this stuff. 
All right, final question. Again, on the same video bass traps, I've got this annoying resonance at 126 hertz. This is by Buttface, 1981. And he asks, can we just, can't we just start with sonar works, especially those of us on an extremely tight budget? Yes, you can, but don't expect miracles. Yeah, room correction, aka speaker equalization, has its limits and you cannot correct for, in particular, the time-related effects that acoustics in the room has on the sound that you're listening to. Yeah, you can basically, with an EQ, correct frequency balance. That's it. Yeah, and even that has its limits, again, because a lot of the peaks and dips that are caused in the frequency response are a secondary effect from the time-related uh, effect the time-related acoustic effect that you're seeing in the room. Yeah, so standing waves and certain types of reflections as well. Yeah, we just had this whole discussion about speaker boundary interference before. It causes very very narrow dips that are basically impossible to get rid of with EQ. Yeah, so yes, you can start with with sonar works, but remember that it's not it won't fix all aspects of your room, especially the time-related ones. And that includes the secondary effects those have on the frequency response. Yeah, so uh, definitely get Sonarworks or any other of the room correction software packages. Yeah, a lot of them will do uh, will help with balancing out the tonality of your system. And uh, some of them actually do some some time related stuff as well when we're, when we're talking about the the basically the phase response of the speaker so how this when the sound exits the speaker yeah don't get that confused with actually correcting time related aspects in the room itself um, but um, but just don't don't think it will solve all your problems because it won't yeah? and uh, uh, basically the way to think about room correction is that you always want to run it at the end of any process of changing things in your room yeah if you do speaker upgrades, if you reposition your speakers, if you do acoustic upgrades, if you make um, geometric changes to your room by moving furniture around, any of this stuff, you always want to then run this type of room correction software again afterwards to recalibrate to the new acoustic response of the room that has happened as you made these changes. Yeah, so it's basically it's just always like do whatever you can apart from correction and then run the correction. Yeah, then when you're upgrading, do whatever you need, whatever you want in order to upgrade, then run the correction again. Yeah, so it's always the final step in the process. Also with the uh, the with the the idea that you want to minimize its impact as much as possible. Yeah, because it does come at a cost, in particular headroom. Yeah. Um, so if you're boosting things with an EQ in a speaker, that can very quickly rob you of a lot of headroom. If your speaker isn't properly protected from it, if you're not using the software pro properly, you might damage your speakers even by doing so. Yeah. So uh, you want to minimize the use of room correction as much as possible, but it does have its place in the process in the chain of things that you're doing to optimize the sound and it's always going to be at the last the last thing you do in that chain all right with that that wraps up my youtube comments q a i hope you got something out of that a lot of interesting questions keep them coming i hope you're well speak soon